here is an example of what you're going to see throughout the presentation today. Pretty much all of the slides will look like this. You can see what the title of the release feature is, followed by the release number and month. So this means you have to be on this release number for your Encore to have access to the new feature. Besides that, it also shows you where you could find the feature in a software and we've also provided the description of the release itself. You can also find a photo to show you what the new feature looks like. As mentioned before, if there is a tutorial video available, it will be linked with the video icon on the bottom left of the slide. So with that said, thank you so much again, and I'm going to pass it over to Corey, who is going to start off with what's new in Encore. Thanks, Valida. Hi, everyone. This is Corey Reed. I'm going to go over the first uh, section of slides here in what's new in Encore 2023. So starting off with some general updates here. Uh, the first one is an update to our Clearview theme. So if any of you are not aware of what our Clearview theme is, basically is a refreshed look to the UI that we released. Uh, previously, and the enhancement here to this uh, Clearview theme is we have now introduced what we call a record breadcrumb, which basically allows you to see which record you have selected. So in the use case where you're in a sub tab of a setup item, so like you can see in this example, um, I'm in a sub tab of sales areas, for example. So I'm no longer on the general screen where I can see what the main description of the item is. And this breadcrumb tells you which uh, record you have highlighted in case you've forgotten which record you're, you're viewing at the time. So a nice little quality of life feature there uh, so that you can see which record you have highlighted. So next up is an update to Encore Hosted. So for those of you clients that are hosted by us at uh, Jonas, uh, the enhancement here is that uh, Encore Hosted can now utilize a report scheduler tool. Uh, the report scheduler is a feature we released previously, but it uh, originally, it was only available for client server versions. And if you're not aware of what it does, it allows you to basically schedule reports to automatically email at a certain time every day. Um, and originally, again, it wasn't available for hosted clients, and we now have made it available for Encore Hosted. So next up, diving into Accounts Payable. This is an option that uh, improved the vendor selection. So uh, the feature here is that now, if you have searched for a particular vendor, and there's only one match in the search bar. So in the quick search where you see just one match, you can now simply click the, or hit the enter key on your keyboard uh, or tab key, and it'll automatically select that record. Whereas before you either had to hit the down arrow on the keyboard uh, or use your mouse to highlight the record. Now you can simply hit enter. And if there's only one search result, it'll actually select that automatically. So next up was an improved or an enhancement to our uh, import invoices and accounts payable. We've added a new format here, uh, specifically for a couple of partner vendors, uh, Beanworks and Birch Street, uh, which are a couple of uh, companies that offer AP automation. And the enhancement here is we have a new uh, import format that allows you to import with invoice notes and also expense descriptions. So those are a couple of specific fields that can come over from Beanworks or Birch Street. And we now have that ability to import those. Next up is an option that was added to uh, import invoices also. We now allow the ability to select receipts for inventory. So previously when you would import invoices, this feature was actually disabled uh, where you could not select receipts. We have now enabled this feature where you can select receipts after importing invoices. So next up is a feature. Uh, we've added a minor quality of life feature here. Uh, when you're using the program called affiliated club charges which if you're not familiar with that that's where you can enter charges for reciprocal clubs uh, so maybe one of your uh, vendors went to or one of your members sorry went to a, a affiliated club purchased something that club has now sent you an invoice you have to enter into accounts payable uh, which then you can bill back to your members all in one step in accounts payable and the enhancement here is you can now see the member's name clearly on the screen after entering their member number in the grid. So before you would either have to look up the member and or enter the member number, but after you pressed enter or uh, tab to move on to the next field, you couldn't really see the member's name as a confirmation for who you'd selected. So now right kind of in the middle of the screen above the uh, grid, you can see which member has been selected. Uh, next up was a change to our 1099 forms. We've now updated them to match um, uh, the changes that the IRS made for the 2023 tax year. Uh, only form 1096 was impacted this year. Uh, we also continue to support the FIRE electronic filing system, which remains available at least through to the 2023 filing season. 
Uh, next up was a change to uh, manual checks. Um, we now allow you to actually change the manual check number after processing checks. So before that was disabled where the check number would be grayed out. Uh, now we actually allow you to edit that manual check number in the invoice uh, processing screen um, and then actually reprocess the check and post the batch. So as long as you haven't proceeded to post the batch, you can now change the manual check number, reprocess and post. Uh, so next up, we've added a few uh, columns to uh, certain setup grids in the system. Uh, quality of life items here where you can add, uh, now see the bank account name in the payment items comb selector. Um, so that way you can uh, confirm you have the right bank account. Another one we've added is the default user to the workstation grid. So that way you can easily see which user the workstation is assigned to. Another one we've added to a setup grid is the total amount for fee billing agreements. Whereas before you had to actually open the fee billing and see the dollar amount. Now it'll clearly display right on the grid if you add that using the column selector. All right, so now moving on to accounts receivable. In accounts receivable, we have now offered the ability to override the billing agreement frequency in our pre-authorized payments program. So a lot of you, I feel like will like this feature. This is for the use case where maybe you need to reprocess a certain member. Uh, so for some reason they need to be processed twice within the same month using the PAP program. Before, if you had that member set up for a billing frequency of say monthly, for example, then the system would not let you reprocess their payment without actually modifying their payment schedule to a different frequency such as other, for example. So now on the fly, you can actually check this box to override the billing agreement frequency, and you can actually process any of those payments anyways, regardless of what their uh, payment frequency is set up for. So next up, uh, specifically for the member export report, uh, we've added a couple features here. First off, we've added a tab uh, for step two which allows you to select members and filter members. And then also we've made a change here where this report actually runs to a grid view by default. Uh, since this report is designed more for an Excel export anyways, now the system will automatically export to a grid view, which then allows you to export to Excel from there. Next up was in a, a feature added for both accounts payable and accounts receivable. In the vendor search and the member search, uh, an account inquiry and vendor inquiry, for example, you now have a real time search, which is a really nice feature. Instead of having to click the lookup and go into the separate full screen lookup, you now can actually just start to type in the search field and it'll populate search results similar to other places in the system that we've already done this. Um, and you can actually just select the vendor or member from there without actually having to type in the member number exactly or go into the separate lookup screen like I mentioned before. Okay, so next up is a feature we've added to uh, POS pricing rules. So in the POS pricing rule screen, we've added two columns uh, for the retail price and member price. So this should make your life a little bit easier when editing pricing rules and you're trying to come up with a logic for how much you're gonna discount either by percentage or amount. Uh, you can now see that member price and retail price of the item you've selected right in the grid in the price rule setup. All right, so moving on to Encore Tea Time. So for those of you golf clubs uh, here that utilize our Encore Tea Time module, really nice feature here. We've added uh, the ability to bulk uh, process chits for the day. So previously, you could only check in tea times one by one and transfer them to the point of sale. We've now added ability under the actions button to actually process all chits for the day uh, if you want to. So at the end of the day, if you just want to process all chits and member charge them, for example, you can actually send the entire T sheet over to uh, Jonas Encore point of sale. Uh, what it'll do by default is actually put it in the open chit screen that you can see at the bottom left here. And from there, you can select whether you want to settle and close all chits, for example. Uh, or you could actually still settle them one by one from there if you needed to. All right, the next feature is still under Encore Tea Times. We now have the ability to actually email the tea sheet. So uh, use case here is you have maybe a weather delay, frost delay, something along those lines. You can actually email the players on the tea sheet right from Encore Tea Times. Uh, previously, we did not have this ability and you had to utilize some sort of other uh, mail engines such as Clubhouse Online, email marketing, for example. 
um, which was a few extra steps that you had to, you know, export the list of t uh, players and such. Now we streamlined this uh, feature where you can actually email the entire T sheet right from Encore T Times. All right, another feature we've added to Encore T Times is a new module called Enhanced Lotteries. So um, if you run a lottery at your club, which if you don't know what that is, basically it's where members can make requests for tea times, but they don't necessarily get a tea time uh, right out of the gate, but they more get put in, put their name in the hat for a lottery and then the lotteries run. Um, and then the, the results are announced to the golfers who have entered the lottery. So we've added a whole new module for this with all kinds of robust features here. Um, including the ability to link lottery groups. Uh, you can do unlimited point ranges and also various calculations and allocations. Uh, if you are interested in this feature, make sure to contact your uh, Jonas Encore sales rep. Minor improvement here we also did to Encore Tea Times is with the membership type integration. You now have the ability to actually edit the descriptions of your membership types without uh, jeopardizing the integration between Jonas Encore accounts receivable and uh, Jonas Encore tea times. Before this is a bit of an issue because the results that we had synced previously didn't match the new descriptions. Uh, we now have made improvements here to be able to handle those uh, edits when it comes to membership type descriptions. All right, so moving on to Jonas Quorum, which is our PMS integration uh, for hotel rooms, cottages, things like that. Um, in this release, we've added to the point of sale member lookup screen, uh, the ability to select either a group account or a house account uh, from the core and PO, uh, PMS system. So you'll find this in a new drop down box called search column, uh, where you can select either that group account or house account. Uh, next up was an enhancement also to quorum integration. Uh, when it comes to the uh, guest folio name description, so this is for when members might be uh, allowing a guest to use their member account to stay at a hotel room at the club, for example. We now can turn on this flag to create the description using the folio guest name. So it'll actually send over the guest name uh, along with the description of the charge to the member account. Next up is another feature for quorum integration. We now support pre-check-in and post-checkout POS room charging. So before the guest had to actually be checked in, in-house, but not checked out in order to charge to their room from the point of sale. So this opens up the door for members that may be waiting on their room, for example, and they can't check in. So they want to go to the dining room uh, and have dinner or have lunch and bill it to their account or vice versa. If they've already checked out, uh, but they want to have lunch on their way out, then they can still bill to their room. It'll prompt a warning to the user that uh, the person is not currently checked in. Uh, so that they know what the situation is and they can choose whether to um, whether to actually use it or not. On the flip side, if this reservation is actually flagged as what's called a restriction in Quorum, uh, the user will be provided a message with the info, but will be prevented from using it. Uh, another one for Quorum integration, we've uh, made a change here for resigned members. And this was just an improvement to our sync between Jonas Quorum and Jonas Encore accounts receivable. Uh, previously, uh, in certain configurations, uh, the syncing would actually stop when they were uh, changed to a non-synchronized status. And our change here is we will now permanently synchronize any profile once it has been synchronized to Quorum, regardless of the status configuration it's in now. All right, so moving on to General Ledger. In General Ledger, we've uh, added the ability to be able to unpost tasks. This is a really high re highly requested um, option here. So in a uh, general ledger under journal entries or in the GL inquiry, for example, we can actually unpost a journal entry, which is really cool feature. Um, now we do have some security around this, uh, some prerequisites that have to be met. For example, the fiscal period has to actually be active. You cannot do this for a fiscal period that is inactive. Uh, so the period has to be open basically where you can still make changes to it. Um, we also show the edit, so there's no way to actually remove the entry entirely. It just basically allows you to reopen it, change it, and then post it back. So uh, along those lines, we ask, we record all the edits that happen here, uh, which you can see on the audit number under the view edit screen. Um, and also the user has to have the ability to unpost tasks, which is a um, user option in itself. But again, another highly requested feature to be able to unpost journal entries, uh, make changes to them, and repost them. 
So next up, we added the uh, report email scheduler to the general ledger. So at first it was only uh, released for certain modules. Uh, in June of 2023, we added the general ledger and event management to uh, the report scheduler. So now you can use those two modules to um, schedule reports to be emailed automatically. Um, currently, the uh, reports automatically send at 4 a.m. If you are not aware, that is not customizable at this time, but every day at 4 a.m., any reports you have set up to um, be scheduled to email will email at that time. All right, another highly requested feature here was for the detailed general ledger report. We've added a column to the end of the, this report, which shows the running ending balance uh, on a per transaction uh, line basis. So before it would show just the credits, debits, and then at the end of the period, it would show the totals. Now on every single row, we show that running ending balance as it goes. Next up, we did some improvements here to our financial statement design, specifically for the, the design type called cash flow statements. So if you're attempting to design a cash flow statement to your club, we've added a few features here specifically for that type. Uh, first off, we've added the ability to reverse values in calculating totals, uh, specifically in the financial statement line group. Also in the financial statement line group, we've added the ability to retrieve the beginning account balance from the start of the fiscal period. So that was a big one is previously all our calculations were always showing at the end of the period. So for a cash flow statement specifically, you can now tell it to retrieve the beginning account balance uh, from that period. Lastly, we've added the option to show a net income line, which will pull the net income for the fiscal period on the report. Uh, so you could show that basically at any point in the report, rather than having to put it at the end of the report like we had to before uh, in order to calculate the range of accounts. Now you can simply place that net income line anywhere you wish. So a few different changes there we've made, uh, hopefully which will make it a little bit easier to design cash flow statements. Uh, next up, this is specific to the budgets and forecast program. We now allow you to actually minimize the budget entry screen. That way you can sort of multitask. We got the feedback a lot that uh, users found themselves having to close the budget entry screen, then maybe go into like the GL account inquiry to look up an account or its balance or something along those lines. We now allow you to actually minimize the screen without having to get out of the budgets and forecast program. Uh, so that way you can go to those other programs in the system. Now, in order to do that, it does require you to activate uh, the convert to full screen option. So that way it sort of is its separate window under budgets and forecasts that you can then minimize and then move on to other programs within the system without losing your place in your budgets uh, entry screen. Okay, so lastly, here on the general ledger side, uh, we've made a change here to prevent the deactivation of a GL account used for retained earnings. So that was a feature we found. Uh, some clubs ran into some issues where they could accidentally deactivate their retained earnings account. So now we've actually put a control in place here that if your account is set up for retained earnings, you can no longer deactivate it. So it'll force you to keep that account active. And with that, I'm actually gonna pass it over to Maz and he's gonna take us starting out here with online ordering. All right. So uh, starting off in the point of sale area for online ordering, um, there, there is a need for some clubs uh, that have implemented the order throttling feature um, that kind of keeps the the prep areas in check to the number of orders that can be placed online between a, a window of time. Um, we do understand that there's some menu items that are outside of the uh, of the throttling uh, threshold because they don't really need preparation, like a Stella beer, as an example, or any um, other items that the club would uh, wish to exclude. Uh, from counting towards the thr uh, throttle rule. So if an order um, is made only for uh, menu items that are configured with the new flag called exclude from counting as an order from throttling, those an order with only items that, um, that are set up this way would not be counted towards the throttle limit or the order limit that is established uh, for the outlet and, and that time range. Um, so this allows for clubs to be a little bit more flexible for members that are ordering um, items from an outlet where some items are being prepared, others are not. Um, and that way you can respect um, the throttling limit for just items and orders that uh, should be subject to that because they need a preparation time and um, require some um, uh, levels of uh, availability from the kitchen or the other prep areas. Okay, 
the next the next item that we did was uh, the order type label was added to the order ready message for Encore specifically for those clients that um, are using online ordering today. Uh, upon uh, once an order is ready, there is an order ready checkbox in the online ordering queue that used to that sends off a message to um, individuals. Uh, but it, to the customer and the member so that they can, you know, kind of get that notification that your order is ready, come on to the pickup window or wherever that is to, to come get your order. Originally, it was a bit confusing for the end member receiving that message. It did not include the order type label, like to go or delivery. Um, so it was kind of just telling them that their order is ready, but it didn't really give them that additional piece of information. Um, so we've updated both the summary uh, subject line for the email, as well as push notification summary and the details in the body of the email, as well as the push detail to include that order type label so that it's clear um, to the to the member that they've gotten the notification, their food order or drink order is ready and what type of order it is so that they have an expectation of where they're going um, to collect it or if they're waiting for someone to deliver it in the case of delivery. So th those were the two main things for online ordering um, within our point of sale. What, we, what we've done, this is a really great feature. Uh, shout out to uh, the clients that are on the line today um, from John's Island Club. Uh, this was one of their requests and we understand a lot of clubs will benefit from this feature. It's essentially enhancing the point of sale layout, uh, table layout status colors. We've always done um, layout status colors for an unoccupied uh, unoccupied table or an occupied or ordered enter table or chit printed table so that as you uh, an order is processed by staff, anyone visually looking at the layout can indicate by color color configuration where that table is in the process of that service. So um, we've taken it a step further in this feature where we've now added the ability to configure optionally, of course, um, layout colors for courses. Um, so for those clubs that do fire courses, now staff would be able to visually see on the layout whether, you know, the salad course has been fired or the ap appetizer course has been fired um, or if the um, entrees course or dessert course has been fired. So uh, you really get that visual notification, um, you know, on the screen. Um, and again, this is not mandatory. It's in addition to and it can be enabled only for um, you know, clubs that are firing courses. But again, that additional level of detail and information really helps service uh, when I can visually look at a screen and say, you know what, table five is almost done. It's either desserts are fired um, and get that visual indicator. In addition to what we did before, which was just order sent, um, we're going now into that fire course capability. To set this feature up, pretty simple. Um, go into point of sale settings, which is under point of sale setups. Um, and then there's a new section added called fire course status colors. Check the box that says include last fired course status color. All your courses um, that are configured in the system that require firing uh, will be um, indicated in the list. You, you can then send a, set a desired text color and a table color. Um, for those courses and then hit the save key that really enables the feature. There's also the uh, ability for you to set the colors right on the courses setup. So if you know, you know if for those clients that are not using courses today, if you are configuring your courses, you will see those colors in the courses setup itself under point of sale setup uh, courses. Um, and you can set up the colors while you're configuring your courses as well. And then all you would need to do in that case is come in here, check the box and all those colors should kind of default for the course colors that you've configured um, in the course setup. So Here's an example. Um, should have moved on to the next slide, but for those, as I mentioned, within the course setup under point of sale setups courses, you have the, the ability on the right hand side um, and that's where you can set the text color and table color. If you're doing it here, when you go to point of sale settings to enable the feature, it will be um, it will be visible um, there as well. So you can do it on a course by course basis or do all the courses through the settings uh, while enabling the feature. Here's an example of what the appetizer course looks like when it's Kind of set up with that table color visually anyone looking at that table can take a look that appetizers have been fired um, versus the other colors uh, that may be configured okay. all right so uh, another great feature uh, again for food and beverage primarily on the point of sale side again service wise we understand that clubs that have a lot going on busy a lot of orders going on uh, sometimes staff 
uh, needs a little bit more information on a visual or a reminder. Um, I should say a notification really regarding the status of a table that may have unsent or unsent items that require preparation that have not been sent um, after, you know, a desired X minutes of time. So what we've done is we've created this new um, order uh, unsent items layout alerts and it it essentially in point of sale settings under layout colors right below the fire core status color feature that we just went over uh, previously there's a section called unsent items um, and you can actually set the number of minutes along with an uh, a unique color that would then basically flash um, flash for users um, when that uh, when the, those number of minutes have have lapsed um, for any order that has one or more unsent item that requires preparation. So in today's example on the screen, I had a firecracker, firecracker shrimp. Um, it hasn't been sent. You'll notice in the bottom section of the screen, a new time lapse field has been added. It's showing 11 minutes. My configuration was for 10 minutes. Um, so after, after the 10 minutes has, uh, has been lapsed, the user is now visually at the bottom getting a time lapsed notification. And then on the, on the second screen here that we're gonna kind of go over, Oh, wait. Okay, maybe they didn't give the example because obviously on a picture you won't be able to see the flashing. But if I just go back a screen, essentially where we see the appetizer course fired, um, if I had set that notification color, the table actually flashes. It kind of flashes for the user on the layout screen, letting them know that, you know, this table needs attention. There may be an item um, on this order that requires to be sent, and it's past the time that it should have been sent based on the configuration. In today's example, 10 minutes. So, it is a good visual for staff in order to set it up. Again, we're in POS settings, layout colors, right below the fire core status colors, the unsent items, order sent, enter uh, the a whole number in minutes. We don't do partial, just, you know, no minutes and seconds, just whole number minutes, and then set the color that you'd like. And today's example in that second screenshot on the right, it's an orange color that we set so that it'll flash on the layout to give the visual on a selected order in the bottom right will give the time lapsed in minutes for users to be able to see how long um, that item has not been sent for. All right, so chit receipts, forms, text format, February, uh, in February in 23.220, we did add um, the ability to include the member number and name um, below the signature line and member signature text that was added um, so that for those clubs that have moved to text forms that we can provide that signature um, we can support electronic signature um, in a way where we just describe that the member uh, member number and name has been included below that line that way you know when a member is signing they can confirm who they are make sure the person got the right uh, john smith in the system and then sign for their ticket before this change um, they would have to read the header of the ticket the top of the ticket um, which is far uh, you know, far away from the signature line to proof uh, the member number and name. This feature is great for those clubs that like to um, service in a certain order. Um, essentially, uh, the identify gender by seat was rolled out in, in March. Um, it is a sales area configuration. So for those clubs that are on today's line um, that are interested in, in providing staff with the ability to not only assign items to a seat number but assign a gender to a seat number um, and items within that seat that way staff um, servicing the order or running expediting the order to the table can serve um, certain genders first um, so essentially females and children get served before males uh, in in these clubs rules and in, in the clubs that we worked on with this feature and what that allows us to do is by sales area enable um, so under point of sale under any desired sales area in today's example the grill um, in the first in the far right screenshot you go to the tables and covers section you'd enable identify gender by seat which is the flag labeled with number five and then from there um, you know, uh, the feature is enabled in point of sale. What that does to the order entry screen on the first screenshot on the far left, it's showing Ellen uh, Goodman as the member. And then if you notice there, we have male, uh, female and child. There's a new control that's added right below the seat controls. Um, and users now have the capability of assigning 
the gender to the seat number. So for seat one, it's defaulting uh, to female because Ellen Goodman in her member file is configured as a as a female gender, hence defaulting. Um, however, if it was an unknown person like a cash or a guest, um, then the user uh, would, uh, you know, select the desired uh, gender to associate to that seat. Um, what this does to the prep tickets for the food runners um, is really, if you'll notice on the far, uh, if, or before the seat, uh, before the feature is enabled, all you get is a seat number for where those items are being sent. And then in the, in the second uh, prep example there in the center screenshot, we're showing that it, it gets enhanced to have the M for male, C for child and F for female. That way you can clearly see what gender and what gender is assigned to that seat for that item so that when you're kind of delivering the food, you know you're going to serve 2F, 2F, then 3C, and then 1M, as an example. There's a, a YouTube video at the bottom um, on some of these slides that allow you to then kind of see this uh, in a little bit more detail if it's interesting for your club. The next feature that we did, this is a wow. I should say it's a it's a great feature for clubs because we, are, we often have large point of sale end of day batches. Um, that we, um, you know, sometimes want to be able to unpost so that we can then fix the original tickets or chits as a part of the batch and then repost it. Um, this was firstly released in April and it did not support inventory batches. Since then, and the, I think in the next screen, it should say that it supports both non-inventoried and inventoried batches. Um, let me just make sure that that's the case. But uh, for everyone, as of the releases that are available today, unpost POS end of day batches is available for non-inventoried and inventory batches. Um, again, just like Corey mentioned in the journal entry post feature, it is a, it requires user uh, users to be granted access to have this capability. To do that, just go to users, select the user that you'd like to give this uh, option um, to, go to restrictions, miscellaneous, and check the flag that says can unpost tasks. Once they have that flag um, enabled against their user account, when they go to an end of day batches screen, they will see previously posted batches um, and be able to actually double click on those batches and then kind of get this view audit trail and unpost uh, button option in the top toolbar, which is the second screenshot um, that's indicating, um, you know, the view audit trail and unpost keys there. So once I click on unpost, um, it would then bring that batch um, back into an unposted state um, and then allowing the user to, at that point, make any edits um, to the tickets by, you know, kind of reopening a chit, adding the missing items or adding the missing tickets from a sales area, and then coming back in and reopening the batch and then posting it off again with those adjustments. So not much setup here. If you have enabled this for the users in users, and then when you go to the end of day batch uh, listing, you should be able to now not only view those um, batches, but double click on them and access them to then unpost um, and, and kind of do that there. The next feature that uh, was done in the member search and point of sale, uh, there are clubs that have very, very large uh, memberships and they have a large family accounts as well and the need for um, filtering their search when looking up a member at the point of sale to only include um, primary independent accounts uh, which was our default um, and then further you know kind of filter down to primary only and then dependent only accounts as an option so you'll notice in the quick member search in the type uh, that has been now added and there's a primary independence, and in the uh, which is our default. It searches everybody today. So upon upgrade of that April release, you probably didn't notice any changes from the staff searching for things. But if they'd like, they can narrow down the search to primary independence only by choosing one one or the other uh, second and third options that were added. Uh, printer redirection. So this is a big one. I would say this is also a wow for those that are on the line because uh, there's been, um, you know, uh, a lot of requests for this feature as well, um, where clubs would like to set um, an alternative uh, printer for preparation purposes, maybe for an area, maybe one kitchen is not open uh, during a certain time of day. So you'd like to redirect those orders to another prep printer. Um, so that has been added uh, to the printer setup. So under system admin, printers, printer redirection, 
um, in the 2023 May release, you'll notice there's a new tab in the printer setup. It's called printer redirection. And in order to enable it, you check the flag that reads activate redirection for this printer. Choose the printer uh, that you want to redirect to. Um, and then within the redirect time rule, there is two options and always, which will always do that redirection. And that could happen in the case that a printer is down at a certain location, you want to just change it out or it's a seasonal uh, type thing that you want to do where you could set it to always. And if it's that other case where maybe um, for a certain part of the day, you want to redirect orders to another printer, you can choose this, uh, the specified time option and then establish the start time and end time for that. This one, uh, this feature here is mostly for uh, member receipts in the retail environment. Um, you'll notice that uh, with our forms, uh, we've now added the capability of including a savings line at the end of the ticket. Um, again, optional can be enabled by simply going into your text form and enabling the new field that says show hide member retail price difference and enable it to true. What this really does is it shows members the difference between their member and guest price or the member and retail price that is configured in the sales item setup so that if a member is getting member pricing um, we can highlight the savings which is the difference between the guest and member price value um, at the end of the ticket um, and this savings is a total uh, is a total of all the items on the order um, and the and the difference between that retail value and the member price value it's kind of nice just to show members that you know they're getting getting that savings again this has primarily been requested from retail where retail items and inventory typically have a spread between uh, retail and member price but it's not restricted in our system it can be enabled for um, any you know any form for any sales area that you're using um, so in today's example it shows a chip and dip and some food and beverage items but um, typically uh, would be a retail example So uh, on this side here, this is a new, um, it has come up with some clients where they wanted to expand the number of, uh, uh, the, they wanted to enter in large quantity values for an item that's sold in point of sale. Um, we have turned that on. If that's something that's in, you know interesting your club that you, you, you're interested in enabling, you will have to reach out to support it so that we can log in. Um, and enable uh, or increase, I should say, the max number of digits in the quantity field in the point of sale. Um, so it has gone from 999 uh, to uh, 99,999 as the max, which is five digits. Um, but right now, all your systems are configured with three digits. So if your club does have the need to sell items at very large quantities, um, please feel free to send an email to support or log a ticket through the support site. Um, and make a request and our team will be happy to come into these special options that are restricted to only our support GJ system user to increase that from a three to a five or a four, whatever you'd like. Um, and then once we save that POS setting, you'll notice that, um, you know, the new quantity field will be stretched to that, to that value. So, uh, the next feature is, um, really beneficial for clubs that have um a single item sold in multiple areas um and you really want to be able to manage the the countdown that's available by sales area as opposed to one countdown value um one countdown value that's uh you know applying to that item being sold across all the areas an example would be um you know i offer the grilled chicken lettuce wrap today at my grill and men's grill um, but I have two separate area, two separate uh, kitchens that are going to prepare it. Um, and today I want to give an available quantity of 10 for the grill and the men's grill can only make five of that item. So I'm now able to specify by area, um, you know, those those quantities available and track those countdowns um, a little bit more uh, granular by by area. Um, in order to turn this on, it's not in a new spot. Um, you can go to the any sales item that you want to enable countdown so you go to the same countdown tab under point of sale 
Um, and then you'll notice there's a new flag that's been added that's highlighted as number three today, where you can enable the track countdowns for this item by sales area flag. That will then disable the countdown settings for the for for um, you know the overall countdown single value across all areas. So it's an either or. So either you want to set it up where you you know you give the qu countdown available quantity of, that's going to be used across all areas, or you need to specify it by area. Um, and then from here, in this example, as I mentioned, putting the 10 for the grill and the 5 for the men's grill allows me to then um, break that out as opposed to putting 15, um, you know, uh, overall for the item and not being able to really control how many the grill can make and how many the, uh, the men's grill can make. There's a video there um, from the YouTube. You can turn it on and take a look at that um, if you need more details um, um, for that feature. Okay, so the next feature we're moving into July here um, and for for credit card processing um, for those clients that use um, Alavon or ETS uh, credit card in, uh, with uh, with our solution for integrated processing um, you we have now added um, a new uh, a new transbond build in the Encore installation folder um, and it's quite it's quite a large file. So what we've done is we've added a one click download icon um, that can kind of get that uh, install for that credit card processor um, in, you know, get that installer downloaded on a workstation. When are you going to use this when things aren't going so well on a computer? So if a point of sale computer is gone, has gone down and you're reinstalling Jonas uh, Encore point of sale on it and it needs to take credit cards because you still have the device there. Um, we ship out uh, Elevon um, Transvault credit card processing installer and it's within our install file and we just wanted to make sure it's seamless and quick with that one click download so that you can get the Transvault uh, software installed on that workstation that needs to you know, work um, in harmony with the uh, Encore point of sale in order to charge out integrated credit cards. So just wanted to make sure it's easier to um, get that Transvault install on a workstation without you having to go to a separate Elevon site to go download the file. You can access it with a single click from within the Encore install directory. All right, so uh, this is a better for those clubs that use third-party inventory control, um, you know, such as ClearSky, ChefTech, AccuBar. Um, if you are using one of these third parties, um, you'll notice that uh, the file that was being created every day um, was actually, there was a chance that if you had multiple files for the same day that they would kind of get over, they would overwrite each other. We provided in the configuration of the third party inventory export, we provided um, the uh, default file name always allowed you to put in a custom name. In today's example, it's inventory. But now you get to choose not only uh, a date format stamp, but also a constant, um, a constant value, um, just in case your provider has some naming conventions in order to accept the file for importing it. Um, you know, whether you're pushing it to file directory or FTP, you now have that capability to add some additional uh, unique characters to the file name so that your the third party can accept them as well. So that's really uh, what we've done there for third party inventory export. This is a you know just a a nice to have from an audit standpoint. What we found was that closing a point of sale ticket that had nothing ever added to it, no member selected, no items added. Um, it would not. There was a scenario where it could it was not getting saved. Uh, even though it was a blank zero dollar ticket so that chit number would get skipped and we all know from an auditing standpoint that we want to make sure we can account for every chit number reference in our point of sale systems um, so we wanted to make that change to make sure that we're closing that empty chit or marking it as a void um, so that it hits your end of day report as I believe we ended up as a void um, so it will be in the void section um, and then that way if users are just starting a ticket and kind of closing it off or leaving it, um, we're not losing those chip numbers for you in the reporting. So that's been added. And I should mention, sorry, that was in September 23920. All right. So as we move on here to Elevon uh, for point of sale in October, uh, what we did was this is a this is actually a, 
I would say it's still a wow for a lot of users that were making mistakes because uh, prior to this change, we servers would often enter an extra gratuity. Um, but while doing that, they would accidentally hit that void payment key. And there was no confirmation. So you quickly swipe the card. You want to add a gratuity. The void payment key is right above that add gratuity key in the first screen on the left hand side. Um, and by accident, if I click on that void payment key, it would automatically void the payment and I would have to start again. Or even worse, what if the customer was no longer there and I couldn't add my grat and finalize my auth? So um, what we did was now when you click on the void payment key, we have added a confirmation that will say, you know, do you want to confirm void credit card payment or go back? And if you click on go back, it'll take you back to the previous screen in one. Um, but if you hit, hit the new button, which is confirm void credit card payment, it would then void the payment uh, completely. So once again, this is a quality of life feature for the servers um, that are you know, operating in a very fast paced environment um, and giving them that final prompt because obviously removing uh, a credit card payment, especially if the customer's out the door is a challenge. So uh, in point of sale, this is mostly for clients that are self-hosted or using some kind of RDP server uh, to connect their users. And essentially in the status bar at the bottom of our Encore sessions, we were not displaying the, um, the terminal ID value correctly um, with the users, um, with the workstation name, which in this case is typically a, a Windows username for the RDP user. So we fixed that um, so that, you know, clubs that are configured for that remote desktop type access can get a nice uh, status on their terminal IDs and see who it is, which is most important. Um, you know, which terminal ID is it, the, the code itself that was established, along with the name itself um, of that user so that they can see who's logged in. In November, uh, we did a auto saving chit feature um, and that's really if a chit was started and left open for an extended period of time, um, it was basically, uh, you know, it would not end up saving some entered details. Um, and when I say extended period of time, it, this is a very, very long time. I, I, I would maybe circle back on the chat to give some, uh, some more detail on what that extended period time window was, but I believe it was like a day or more than a day. Um, you know, it wasn't a few hours, not a shift of a user, so nothing to worry about, but it was more days that it was left open. And in that case, we found that there was some integrity issue where it wouldn't, uh, we would lose, um, some entered items. So we just wanted to fix that up. So we've implemented an auto save. Um, so periodically the chit will auto save for those long running orders. Um, I believe in this case, if you had a, you know, a good example could be a banquet bar, um, where you have one ticket that you're ringing up, adding in all the drinks for your banquet bar, and you're leaving it open, you know, the whole night um, for the whole banquet party, a wedding or something. And in that case, there was that potential that that could happen. So that was one example that I, I recall um, a part of this improvement um, to auto save that detail. All right, so entering into mobile point of sale, uh, we, for those clubs that are using our mobile point of sale app, we, we originally supported Wi-Fi and Bluetooth printing, which was our chit printing type for mobile point of sale app. Since then, in February of last year, um, we did add another uh, printer, chit printer support, which is really supporting existing network printers um, that um, are available. So if you do have an existing network shared printer or a network printer that is available for that's in a location accessible by the mobile point of sale app users um, they can you can enable the network printer option under the sales area staff mobile app settings and then switch the chip printing type to network printer and what that would then do is instead of relying on a bluetooth or a wireless printer it would automatically route receipts which include this the, the credit card slip receipts with stripe or the itemized receipt chit receipt it would direct them to that network printer that's established in the next field chit printer um, and then that way it can kind of hit that network printer maybe a bar printer or some some printer that's been shared by your club IT that staff knows to go to collect receipts for uh, for MPOS uh, for them so clubs can eliminate the need of mandatory purchasing Bluetooth and wireless printers and leverage existing network printers um, to facilitate mobile point-of-sale receipt printing. Okay, 
the other item that we added support, there's some clubs that have, you know, based on where you're using the mobile point of sale app, we've heard it's being used for multiple different types of environments. Um, it becomes important to support uh, the feature that we've had in our back office, which is the ability for users to enter an open price on a sales item, which is really uh, that sales item flag that reads ask for price when sold. Um, and for any items in the system prior to this change in February, uh, you would not get the prompt in mobile point of sale to enter the price. So since uh, since this change has been rolled out, those items are now supported. So if you have an open food, an open liquor, um, or um, a fish of the day that you know needs to be entered every day by staff, that was not being uh, that was not provided in the MPOS app. Now it's supported, um, and that was added in February. The next thing that we did in MPOS uh, in August was for iOS, tablet and phone, we noticed that the table number field was bringing up um, an entire alphanumeric keyboard and uh, that keyboard was coming up even for when entering dollar values or cover values. Um, so we've modified the alphanumeric keyboard in iOS to, to provide us a numeric keyboard. Again, this is a quality of life feature staff, you know, in a busy environment. Uh, quickly being able to efficiently enter the table number, any numerical values, give them a keypad, keypad only because less is more instead of giving them the entire alphanumeric keyboard set. So that's been added for iOS there. All right, for member statements, uh, for email member statements, we did add the capability for those clubs that are using you know office 365 or uh, exchange 365 or any other mail client really that has uh you know a rule for how many emails they can send per minute a throttling a throttling rule um and now we've added that capability um for member email statements so that you know there's a higher chance that all the emails are going to make it out especially because the email statement program is doing we improve speed of processing there was a lot of feedback towards the end of the year uh, the end of the previous year that email statements can take take quite a long time and in that case um, you know we uh, we wanted to make a change so that we can uh, obey the throttling rules for your email provider um, and throttle based on that rule so you know as an example 30 emails a minute um, for for office 365 we can now set that um, for email statements for members oh i should mention if you need to turn that on if that's a concern you're, you're seeing that some emails aren't going through because you're hitting your provider's limit, uh, please contact Jonah Support. Um, it's a GJ system only a feel, um, feature, so we'll be happy to enable it for your club after going through some details regarding um, your provider. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to system admin here. Uh, this feature is actually a high security feature, uh, you know, Okay, I'm going to quickly go over this feature here with user security, um, prevent users from changing, altering another user's password. This is a big one for those clubs that have managers looking at the list of users and they shouldn't have the ability to change other users' passwords. So we've added this flag under restrictions and miscellaneous and it allows uh, with that flag on that reads cannot modify other users' passwords, release lock accounts once you have that flag on for a user they should not be able to change other users passwords but their own i believe just with the time that we're running up here um we added a last security feature which was really around same you know managers that have access to access to the users list but you want to uh, control which user groups they have access to and which users they can control or edit um, so we've added a, the capability for restricting users to selected user groups, again, under the restrictions tab, under the user group restrictions sub tab that's been added. And in order to restrict a user to certain user groups, just have to mark those ones as eligible and save it. Um, you know, the great example is that food and beverage manager um, should have access to only his servers and bussers, um, but really uh, not access to any other group. So that would be really the use case here for your club to enable it for those department managers, not those super users that exist. Uh, the last, I think in July here, we added uh, you know some more security uh, enhancements around on uh, support tools, which really means anything that Jonah support uses to access your club's uh, data, we've put another 
password authenticated login behind that so that we can um, you know ensure that we have you know only authorized Jonas employees are accessing those security tools This is just a slight um, improvement in workstations. So in your workstations list for those clubs that have many areas, so larger installs, we wanted to increase uh, the window view. So you had less scrolling um, while uh, viewing restrictions, sales area restrictions by point of sale workstation. We've also added the ability in your forms for your point of sale chit receipts, the ability to edit the font on a chit header. This was not possible uh, originally. That has been added um, so that you can kind of customize those headers. Uh, you're, most likely it's going to be your, your club name. Last part here was for those clubs that deactivate printers, primarily point of sale uh, printers. Uh, once we deactivate printers, um, let's say a printer is no longer going to be used at the club. They're re redoing the configurations. Originally, when, when you deactivated a printer, which means you uncheck the active flag on the printer setup, um, that printer, if assigned to sales items or categories, would still be included as a part of the, the configuration for preparation sending. Um, we've now corrected that so that it, it removes that printer from those categories and groups, um, keeping things clean as people are maintaining their printer setups. I believe the last one, last couple ones here in November was again just a, a you know a nice to have for when we run into issues working um, you know with clubs specifically around a specific workstation something is taking longer or it's you know kind of slow and we need to get additional details we've added the ability to turn on extended logging on a workstation basis so if support ever asks this of you know anyone at the club it's under the workstation setup under the general tab and then there's a flag at the bottom that says enable extended logging so that just needs to be turned on and saved then we can grab additional logs that have more details than than just uh, regular logging and with that, I'm going to be passing this over to Rob Lamana. I appreciate everyone's patience since I went a bit over. And, and I'm going to be switching, uh, switching over now. Thanks, Maz. Uh, I'm going to start by going through activity tracking. Uh, this feature applies to very few clubs. I don't know how many are using it. We offer the ability to have a member display with activity tracking. So people in a particular area, the one instance I know of that this is being used is in a gym where members can see on a TV screen all of the members that are also in that activity as well. Um, now we've added the ability for you to launch the application directly into this mode. So you can see with an activity tracking, you set up uh, the workstation to run only for member display. You enter a password to exit activity tracking, and then immediately upon double clicking the icon, it'll launch into the default monitoring area specified so that people can see who else is in the activity at the same time and as they arrive and leave. Moving on to dining reservations, one of the bigger features we added <clears throat> in the summer of last year was the ability to set up a waiting list for walk-in reservations. Um, so once enabled, you'll be able to take requests. Um, upon taking the request, we'll check to make sure that that request cannot already be satisfied by a reservation. I'll just skip through some of these slides. You can see this create request button that's now present. You can view the waiting list and you can assign waiting list requests. So when creating a request, you're gonna set up a date in an earliest and latest time and then if a table should come available due to a reservation ending early or a cancellation taking place this button the assigned waiting list button will flash green and you'll be able to click on that and assign any tables any reservations that are waiting upon that, you can pick among all the valid uh, requests that are in the system for a particular table of a given size so you can see that there's a bunch of different tables now available for roger smith i can assign a particular table and upon doing so, I'm taken to the booking screen where I can save and close it. Because this reservation is being created from a request, there'll be a notification that gets sent out via email, push notification and or um, SMS texting so that the member receives a notification on their device to indicate to them that the table is now ready or will be ready at a future time, depending on when the reservation is created and when the actual reservation is taking place. So a nice feature, especially if you have a busy dining room, and when people walk in and there are no tables available for them, you're sending them up to the bar. Now, instead of using a pager of some kind or a vibrating device like you would find at a chain restaurant, they'll get a notification directly to their phone by one or all of those three methods I mentioned. We also added the ability for a clean, dirty status on tables when assigning them 
from either dining reservations or in point of sale. So if the table is upon closing a reservation, a user will be prompted to say, uh, table is ready, not ready, or ready and start a new chit. Um, when it's marked as ready, then, reserve, then other people walking in can be assigned to that table, or a reservation from dining reservations can be assigned to that table if that's where it's taking place. Or if it's marked as not ready, nothing can be assigned to that table until it is made ready. So nice feature for busy dining rooms where there's busing that needs to take place in between the last person at the table and the next reservation or person arriving into the dining area. From an event management perspective, um, big feature requested by many of our clients is the ability to send out responsive notifications. So email notifications previously were not responsive and when opened on a mobile device, um, it was difficult for members to see all the information. So in order to make that possible, we introduced a responsive version of these forms. There's some information that is club configurable, like your logo at the top. You can use any image off the internet from your club. Um, the message, the initial subject matter here, so event canceled. This section where you give them sort of an information as to what's coming is club configurable. The details of their event registration, or in this case, cancellation, are hard coded uh, based on what we put in there. And then, of course, in the last section there, which is also club configurable, you can provide them with a call to action should they have any further questions about their reservation or the cancellation that took place. It's all available through the form designer. You can choose the responsive, um, the responsive designer to do so. We also introduced an event edit log to track edits made against events. Here are all the various things that we're tracking at this point in time. So across event level, event itself, the facility, the services assigned, as well as the resources. And we're going to add, we're going to add more to this over time. But for now, these are the modifications that will be tracked within the edit log. From an edit log perspective, the, we'll track the date, the time, what was done, add, update, or delete, which user performed it which area of the event it took place in, so details or date and time or facilities, services, et cetera. Um, the reference indicating what was changed, uh, what field was changed. So if you have a service item that had its quantity, its price, um, and its discount all changed, there would be an indication for each of those changes as they were made, what the previous value was and what the new value was, uh, the reason if you added one in the note, and any kind of details if you want to click on it, you can see more detail of the change. So within the event screen, you'll now have this new view edits button at the top right. And when you look at it, it'll show all the edits from a particular date forward. So in this particular example, it's Monday, May 1st, 2023. And these are all the changes to the event that took place from that date forward. Um, and then as you can see, as I click on the magnifying glass here on this particular change on August 8th, you can see what it was and what it became um, as the price changed. The quantity remained the same and the, nothing else changed in that regard. So it gives you the ability to see A, who made the change, what the change was and the detail level on it. Another big change came in September and that's the ability to display formatted text in event order and event function sheets. So now within events, you'll see a, a separate column called formatted text. If you enable this checkbox within event settings under general, text formatting allow formatted text descriptions what i will tell you is that you need to have new forms designed in order to support this functionality so they'll have new code that allows for the formatted text to replace what you typed initially when you pop open this formatted text box it'll include the information that's already there you can then highlight and modify font color font style font size the font itself um, so that you can make it more apparent to the people consuming that that function sheet or that event order what has been changed since last time you ran it. So you'll see in a given form, once redesigned, you need to check a box that say support formatted text, and it'll give you a little warning, but you can see the output here on this um, event order, all the changes that were put in in terms of um, formatted text so that it stands out to the people that are reading it. Skip that one. Um, we also added this advanced column sort with something called the filter row that is available by clicking this little filter with the plus icon or funnel with the plus icon, which will enable a row at the top of your data, specifically in the event list in this case, when you can start typing um, options to filter the results below. So if you want to see a smaller list, you can enter values in any of the columns and it'll be an additive filter across the board. So if you know the event name or you know the client code or you know the event type, you can filter your results automatically using this filter row. 
We also added the ability to define the registrant to build during registration. Um, so previously this option was only available to you when you're in the launch point of sale or auto charge point of sale where you could specify which member was going to pay for the people on a given booking. This can now be done within the registration itself and it can uh, be set to any person on the booking, whether it's a member or a guest. So you could set for the example we're showing here, uh, Robert Lamana is billed to himself, Elizabeth Grant is billed to herself and John Smith, you can see we're selecting among the three people on the booking, who else could be billed for it. There are a couple of other default features you can turn on where you can say all members pay for themselves or all registrants pay for themselves, in which case it'll default to this model where it's everyone pays for themselves, they're marked as the registered to bill, or alternatively, um, it can be left in the hands of the primary person. So if this booking was made by Robert Lamana, he would be set by default to be the registrant to bill for all registrants on that booking. And again, you can modify that yourselves within the edit um, and then you have the ability to send it over to point of sale as configured. So this will persist through the entire process. As I said, you can turn on this event reg, all members pay for themselves. That's where it sets the registrant to build to the registrant themselves. Um, and then two more features within uh, launch point of sale and auto charge point of sale, where you have the ability to say chit per client or chit per booking. Uh, chit per booking means it'll be one chit for every registrant to bill. So if there's three re three registrants billed to that one person, they'll get one chit for all three. If it's chit per client, then it's going to create an individual chit per row. Now, it doesn't mean that one person or that all these people are going to pay for themselves. It just means that there'll be individual chits for each of them. So if in the previous example, Robert Lamana were paying for all three and we did chit per client, he would have three separate chits billed to him, whereas chit per booking would have created one chit with three registrants on it. There's a nice little warning to tell you what's going to happen when you execute either of those options. Here's a nice little example explaining what I just did. Um, you can read this over when you get the, the document. And I've already covered this as well. So we added another feature to event settings with respect to the event list, and that's relative um, start date. So you have the ability to set the event list start date to be two months prior to today, one month prior to today, or today. Um, so that you can set what events are gonna show within that event list so if you only want from today forward you can change that that's just the default of course when you're in the event list you can modify the start date to see farther back or look farther forward um, but by default you have the ability to limit it to say only show me events one month two month prior or today and that's it for my time we'll now head over to q a so there is a question from candy um is there any eta on the locker program uh, there, there absolutely is. We're we're going for uh, Q3 completion or sometime in Q3 of this year for our Encore Locker program. So just in time for the, I guess for Candy and them in in, in Florida for their next season. Okay. So the question is, I was wondering if there was a way to provide the specific event detail in registration confirmation emails. Um, depends on what you mean. I mean, the, the registration details are specific. Um, so you said, for instance, different attire requirements. So, uh, the only way to do that is to do it by event type. We don't do it by specific event at this time. That's something we could consider for future, but at the event type level, you can, um, set up confirmation specifically for events of that type that can differ from other events of different types. Um, at right now, you don't have the ability to do it on an event by event basis, Carrie. I think that's our last question. So if you have any other questions, you can always contact our support team. It's at support at jonasglove.com. And thank you everyone for attending this webinar today and we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone.